So thank you everyone for coming to the talk. And thank you very much, Monsi, for inviting me. And thank you, for Oscar, for helping to organize the computers that never connect to the projector. And uh, sorry about my voice, because I'm a little bit hoarse. But can you hear me at the back? Yeah, OK, so I'll try to keep my voice low so I won't lose it. Um, so I'm going to present. I have about 500 slides, but most of them are hidden, so you won't see them. And my son said, Mommy, you're crazy. So many slides. So uh, we'll see how we go. And uh, we'll stop when we want to stop. And I'll tell you about some older work from Daisy, and then we'll go on to the newer work. And hopefully, I'll be quick enough to reach enough of our recent work and tell you about that. But you can read a lot of our work and about our papers or email me on our webpage or my email here. Um, this is my group currently, two years ago. There are people come and go. Uh, many of them are Spanish speakers. Ruben is from Costa Rica, Hernan is from Chile, Diego is Brazilian, Isabella is Brazilian, um, Eduardo is from Colombia. Uh, we have some Europeans, and we have very few Australians, but we have a few Australians as well. And I'm from Israel, so it's sort of a very international group, and it's a lot of fun. I think we have people in, my lab is about 15 people, and we have people from about 12 different countries. So it's, and UQ is an amazing place, so you're all invited. We will always find a place for you to sit, and you can just come visit. There's someone from this institute currently in my lab on some internship, so you're all invited. Why am I showing you this picture? If you know, you will get a free lunch. This is a wheat ear, right? It's a beautiful bird, and salit in Hebrew is a wheat ear. Sela means rock, and wheat ear, it's like, you know, it's a southern weight predator, so salit. Um, yeah, and uh, salit, by the way, it's not related to my talk, but is uh, probably, according to, uh, relative to her size, does the longest migration on the planet of about 30,000 kilometers per year. So this bird weighs like two tablespoons of sugar, and it migrates a very, very long migration with two different routes. So that's the salit. I haven't studied it, but I love this bird, obviously. And uh, yes, um, and some of our work, I'll review a little bit about our work before I go into the invasions. And if you work in related areas or you're interested, just contact me after the talk or by email. We do quite a lot of work on cross-boundary collaboration and its importance in conservation, both in terrestrial and freshwater and marine ecosystems. And um, can you see something special about this bird? Anything special? Now look again. See something special? This bird was, this photo was taken 11 years ago in Israel in the Khula Valley, up north, where you probably did count Pepe uh, many years ago. And um, it's migrated from Sudan. And it migrated the whole way with this arrow. This is an African arrow. Someone shot it. And they actually removed the arrow when it arrived as it is, arrives in Israel. It's very interesting to look at all the cross-boundary interactions. What these birds do, the minute they pass the border, this is about 20 kilometers from the border from Lebanon with Lebanon, and the birds know exactly where the border is. And the minute they pass the border, they go very high up, and they continue their migration because they get shot. And they're at much higher risk there. So the birds actually know the boundaries. They know the borders. They know the landscapes. They know where to go up. They know where to go down. Very interesting. And we work quite a lot on these migrations in the marine and how collaboration across different nations um, actually can affect the outcomes of our conservation actions. And we try to incorporate that into our work, both the field work and also work on databases. And I, unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about it today. But a lot of this has been published, and we're continuing to work on these topics. So we're really interested in these conservation <coughs> decisions, challenges, and also the opportunities in this complex world with a lot of our work focused on the Mediterranean Basin and on the Mediterranean Sea. So the uh, talk I'll give in this one at the Cost Action Meeting, it's a nice group called MARCONS. If anyone's interested in marine conservation or conservation prioritization and planning, you can look it up. It's around collaboration and work in the Mediterranean Basin and Sea. And in some of this work, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, I've gone too fast. 
And we're trying to incorporate into conservation research and our field-based research and ecological research some more of the socio-economic and socio-political factors because we are working on a cross-boundary collaboration and how that affects. And I'm collaborating quite a lot with Noam Levine, who also happens to be my partner and is currently with the kids somewhere. Our son refused to leave the hotel this morning, but eventually we managed to get him out of there and they're wandering around the streets, hopefully, um, somewhere. So um, we told him we will leave him alone. We will leave him just there in the room. And he said, I'm going to call the Spanish police. It's illegal. So eventually he came with us. So uh, yes, I have two sons. I won't tell you which one it was. Um, then another area we're looking at before I approach the invasion work is uh, we're looking at um, how we can move from conservation based on our day data, like NDVI, productivity, etc., to work more on information we can get at night. And night is very informative. And one of our most recent papers uh, that Noam and I did was looking at nighttime brightness images and Flickr photos. Do you know what Flickr is? It's like it's Instagram, where people upload photos. And we actually looked at where people visit and take photos and where we have dark areas as potential areas globally for further conservation opportunities. And we recently published that. So if you're interested, you can either email me or just download the PDF from our web page. And on our plane from, I'm, I've been to Israel before I came here for 10 days. And on our plane to uh, Madrid, this is Palma de Mallorca from the plane just this week on Sunday. So you can see the huge effect of night lights. And we're tr starting to work more and more on the ecological impacts and environmental impacts and conservation implications of night lights. So uh, if anyone's interested in that, I'll be very happy to chat a bit more about that as well. Um, another project that I thought might be interesting for some of you is a large project that I, we just started last year and I'm leading, funded by the Australian government. And it's called Saving Species on Australian Islands. It's part of a big research hub called um, the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. And we're doing work on a whole range of species, ecosystems, and in general questions that relate to threatened species, like this species in Norfolk Island that they're now reintroducing and doing a lot of conservation actions. This is just an absolute amazing place, Norfolk Island. So if you ever have an opportunity to go there, go there. It's so nice. And so with this project on Norfolk, oops, sorry, sometimes it's not moving, the slides on. With this project, this is Heron Island, this photo, we're trying to look at the role of islands in the conservation or the threat to endangered species. And that's another area that if anyone's interested in islands, I'll be very happy to collaborate and work more on Mediterranean islands, global islands, and of course, islands in Australia, and we can do some very interesting comparisons. So um, there are a lot of opportunities there, and we're just in the midst of the work. We've been working on this project for about a year now. Australia has 8,800 8, islands. It's quite a lot, and it's an island itself. So now I'm going to move to talk a bit more about the topic that I told you I'll talk about, and that is the um, invasion patterns of alien birds across continents at large scale, comparing Australia and Europe. And I'll start with our European work, where I met um, Monty. I think we met a bit earlier than that. But we met again when she was pregnant and I had my first son. He was 10 months old. And um, we met at the meeting of Daisy that Phil Hume was coordinating. And the goal was to create the first ever database of all species that are non-native to Europe. And we also incorporated Israel and parts of the Mediterranean we could get data for. And so um, we worked on a whole range of different groups from plants to mammals to birds to marine animals and fresh water and tried to you know, build this database so that we can analyze and look at it. And each one was responsible for a different group. My lab was responsible for the birds. And Monty, you were in charge of the plants, probably. And um, it was a very nice collaborative project. And we actually collated data for all introduction events we can put our hands on for Europe, Eastern, Western Europe, the whole 
on the Mediterranean and parts of the Mediterranean. And um, we had two postdocs from France, Francois and Susan from Canada, working with us on the project. And a lot of this has been published, so I'll try to go through it quite quickly to give you context to the Australian part that is more new. The first thing we examined after, of course it took us about two, three years to only build a database, because no one did that before. It was a lot of hard work. But then we had information not only about the number of species in each, in each country, etc., but we also had introduction events. We knew where the species were introduced. It was at a very big scale, so obviously it's not a perfect database, but it was better than anything that existed before, and it was the best we could produce with the time and money that we had. And we could actually start mapping at this resolution that we thought we can more or less trust of 50 by 50 square kilometers, the richness of non-native species in Europe. And you can see some really interesting patterns here. Obviously, you can see some areas with a lot of species, some areas with less species. And you know, all this is quite old, and it was not just done for birds. So we could then compare the patterns for the different taxa and start analyzing and looking at quantifying the bird invasions, studying the determinants of bird invasions, and also looking, is there any role for European politics, for socio-political, for ecological, and economic factors. And obviously, this is all at quite large scales. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's very informative at this scale. What we found overall for Europe, there are 77 successful non-native, you can call them alien, exotic, invasive sometimes people call them, not all of them cause damage that is known to us, bird species that were breeding in Europe in 2008. It's not a very large percentage of all the non-native species, but it is 15% of the European avifauna, so it's quite a nice, well, not a very nice, but quite a large percentage of species that it's quite, you know, substantial and deserves a lot of attention. Prior to that, people usually said that birds are not an issue, there are not that many birds, and in that period, in these recent 15, 20 years, a lot of species actually invaded as well. So it's the Mediterranean and parts of Europe as well, including Spain, like your parakeets here in uh, Sevilla. So a lot of this is quite recent. So maybe they were around sitting there, either at the lag phase with very small populations or non-existent even. But in these 20 years, there have been a, many, many changes. And we can see some patterns in t over time using our database, how it's increasing in different effects of things that happened, historical factors, and I'll talk about that very shortly soon. And we can also start mapping the distribution of alien bird richness and looking at it in the context of the introduction events. The other thing we could look at, which we thought is very useful and was quite novel at the time, is to start looking at the determinants of the exotic bird richness. And if you work on how many people here work on invasive species, at least a little bit, or? So not that many of you, but I'm, I'm sure that you're aware that when species invade, or species are introduced, there are a lot of different phases in this invasion process, from the release and the introduction, or even arrival, to the part where they become invasive and their range grows and they have sub substantial impacts. But there are a lot of different factors that could be shaping the different phases of the invasion. And PETPA has a wonderful new paper in PNAS that discusses just that. Because until today, even now, we don't even know what affects the success or the establishment of the invasion of each stage. It's very hard to defer between the different phases. And so the main hypotheses are around the nat natural characteristics of the area that they arrive in. Then we have you know, a whole range of hypotheses or variables or factors we often test, like the richness of the native species, some climatic factors. This one is quite important for birds very often. Plant productivity, habitat diversity. You can have hundreds of variables that you might be interested in testing. You have human factors. The key ones are usually the number of species introduced, the number of individuals introduced, and the human impact or human activity. And then we have 
the traits of those invasive species themselves that help them in establishment. And those could be their body size and a lot of other. Their origin is very often very important. And in our study, we tested a whole range of uh, hypotheses and variables. And these were the key ones that we eventually incorporated into our hierarchical partitioning model to look at the main variables that actually explain the deviance or the variation in the exotic bird richness in space. And those we call the determinants of invasions. They're really, we don't really know if they are the causes, but they are related to the outcomes, to the spatial distribution of those species. I'll talk a bit more about the methods when I present the Australian work. So what we found for Europe which is maybe not surprising, but up to this work, most people actually looked at these factors. The origin, the more biological factors, because most of the people working on this were ecologists. So most of the work focused on the richness and the climate and the productivity, habitat diversity. Very little attention was given to you know, the more human-related factors, and especially to a really simple factor. How many species have we introduced can that actually explain the number of species that currently exist in the area. So what we found was that these two variables, the number of species introduced and the human activity, which we quantified by human footprint, were the best explaining variables for, or they explain the largest amount of the deviance or the variation in the number of species in each grid square of 50 by 50 kilometers, which was quite interesting to us and quite surprising. It's not surprising after you see the results because we thought, oh, that's obvious. But to us, which we expected, you know, Europe has a big gradient of climates, etc. We ex expected that the richness will be explained much more by these factors, and it actually wasn't. And I think Pepper's new paper that you're all invited to read, I'm advertising your paper, is um, going to take us to study in more detail the different phases if we manage to collect data on those different phases. So. Um, when we started, we could look at those introduction events because we had all the data on introduction events and also the spread of those species. And then we could connect introduction events with the current range. And we could then look at those spatial patterns and also more carefully at the determinants. One really interesting outcome that I wanted to show you, even though it's old, is that just by chance, we looked at the map and we saw that Eastern Europe is very different in the patterns of the richness to Western Europe. And Francois, who was the postdoc, started looking at this in more detail. And what we discovered is that both the uh, Indian bird richness and the number of species introduced was very different into the two historical parts of Europe. And we started looking in more detail at the roles of those socioeconomic factors in shaping Europe's bird introduction factors, uh, patterns. And um, this was really interesting. We looked at the politics that may play some role. And uh, Francois came up with this Cold War hypothesis. And what he thought is that, you know, between 1949 and 1991, there was the Cold War. And there was the Iron Curtain. So this area, there wasn't much trade between these two areas, the eastern and the western parts of Europe. And they were quite enclosed. And Eastern Europe mostly, you know, traded with itself or with China or very few places in Asia, while Western Europe actually traded with the rest of the world and with itself, but did not trade much with Eastern Europe. So when we started looking at the patterns of the, or the variation in the European, which is a straight line, continuous line, and the non-European birds, which is a dashed line, introduced into Europe, we found some really interesting, uh, curious results that could be explained quite easily after you see the results again, but were very surprising to us. This is the number of species in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. You can see that the absolute number of species is much lower in Eastern Europe. These are alien birds. And we can see over here that in Western Europe, there are many non-European species introduced, and it's increasing before, during, and after the Cold War, while the number of European species is declining. It's more or less the same, declining a bit. In Eastern Europe, it's a very different pattern. They're close to the rest of the world. We see a very low number of non-European species introduced, while species like the chucker partridge and other European species are introduced from one country to another for hunting and for other purposes. 
that was quite interesting. And we saw quite a similar result for um, introduction events. But for introduction events, we also see a very significant increase in the number of introduction events during the Cold War of non-European species. So you can see that a lot of the variation is actually explained by these social political factors and by the fact that people couldn't actually trade in these species and other people in, East, in Western Europe actually preferred to trade outside of Europe. So, you know, I won't go through this in detail, but for Europe itself, we know that exotic species are an increasing problem, and we know that very often they're a result of human activity. We know that just periods with non-trade or open trade can affect a lot what's going on in terms of trading with Africa, trading with Eastern Europe, trading with the other parts of the world, and we want that to apply for future management. So we want to think about that. If you are a manager in Poland today, which still has a small number of invasive species, you want to think about it carefully. And if you're part of the EU and you actually want to invest money, you may want to do it in parts of the former Eastern Europe where invasive species are still not a big issue because there hasn't been enough time for them to become a big problem. So, you know, um, that was very interesting for us. And I'll skip this because I'm short in time, but we also followed up with a some work on the impacts of invasive birds in Europe. And we looked at their traits and the different families of birds and the origin of those birds. And we found a big taxonomic bias towards certain bird groups, like the parrots, that are very successful at establishment. And um, we also found that after controlling for those taxonomic effects, there's some interesting patterns around species that are multi-brooded or habitat generalists or form big groups that, can, that have some sort of advantage in the invasion. So a lot of the work for Europe has been published and you're very welcome to read more about it. And um, you know, we know this species for a very long time. This was taken right next to our house in Israel. You all know the species. I saw them in the morning in the Plaza de España, um, bathing and you know, enjoying their time. Big issues, big impact but we're not the first to discover it. This photo is a mosaic from 1500 years ago, from the Byzantine period. So, you know, they've been around for a long time as a captive species. They were probably too expensive to allow them to be introduced into the wild because people would catch them, catch their eggs, and just sell them for a lot of money. But, you know, it's in Israel, for example, where this was taken, they were introduced in the 1960s. We know that they only started spreading in the 1980s. So it took them time, but they weren't around before then. But it's a historical issue. If you go to Australia, it's a very different picture. Australia, this is the first fleet arriving in Australia. It's quite recent, the first fleet. In the 18th century, people, you know, there were Aboriginal people. They did not bring with them invasive birds or alien birds into Australia. As far as we know, they did bring the dingo, which is a, a mammal that has had many, many impacts but were not aware of alien birds that were introduced by the Aboriginal people. And there were special societies in Australia, acclimatization societies of Victoria and other states that were actually intentionally bringing birds to Australia to make it look more similar to Europe, also plants. So they wanted Australia to look like Europe because they came from Europe and they wanted to see what they're seeing back home because they missed home. So, they introduced them into, they brought them in these bo boats and cages. They had multiple introduction efforts and events. And Australia, this is a native species, one of the most beautiful and common species as well, the rainbow lorikeet. How many of you have been to Australia? So quite a few people and you've seen these amazingly beautiful birds in very large flocks. And many of them are, ca are cavity breeders as well. So you're bringing introduced birds into an environment that has many, many native species and a very high diversity of native species and a very different set of native species. And that's a very different story. And that area does not have people around for as long as we do in the Mediterranean or in Europe or in parts of Africa. So it's a pretty different environment than what we're used to from around the Mediterranean. So our goal in the Australian, I moved my lab to Australia four years ago. It's kind of a nice adventure. And um, it's wonderful. We still try to spend time in Israel. A lot of my projects are in the Mediterranean. But um, 
it's very nice to diversify and go to a different place. It's very different and it's an amazing group working on conservation. They're about, we're also in level five, parts of some of you are in level five. There are about 150 people there working on conservation, maybe 30, 40 postdocs and about 10 or 15 academics and many PhD students and other students. So it's really such a nice experience. And everyone's interested in conservation, which I am as well. And our goal in this project was to quantify and map avian invasions in Australia and look at the determinants again to be able to compare with Europe and then look at prioritization of actions. If you have many species in many places, how do you actually prioritize where to act? Is managing parakeets in Sevilla now the most important thing? Probably it is. Or should we deal with the monk parakeets in Madrid because they're doing something else? Do you have monk parakeets here as well? I haven't yet seen any, yeah. So you always have to prioritize your actions for conservation. So how do you actually systematically prioritize? And obviously, once again, you can refer it to invasion hypotheses because what we're seeing for Europe that the results strongly support the human activity hypothesis, which suggests that human activity and you know, the number of birds, the number of uh, species introduced, the human footprint is really a key factor in determining the invasion patterns. But Australia is so different, it doesn't have that many people. It only has 20 million people in it. And it's the size of the USA, it's huge. And it's the size of larger than Europe, you know? So it's a big place with very few people. And it was quite recently settled by you know, people who brought with them alien species. So we can actually test here maybe the rich get richer hypothesis, which suggests that places that are more productive with more native species may actually have more introduced established species. Now we don't know, it may be the exact opposite. We do know now because we've tested it and I'll tell you what happened. But when we started, we were testing a whole set of hypotheses and we didn't really know what to expect in Australia. It was, the first task was obviously for many years, we've been building a big database of not just, you know, the number of species per grid square, but the introduction events. So we can actually go and map the changes in the range and the introduction events and the current spread of those species. And many of the species are currently still expanding their range. Like if you come to Brisbane, you'll see Indian miners and they're expanding their range. So we used a lot of different references, as you can see here. And uh, we had to validate everything. And overall, we found that there were 60 non-Australian bird species introduced between 78 and 88 when the first fleet arrived from England to 2000. Over 600 spatially referenced introduction events. There were many more than that, but we couldn't validate them. These we trusted. So um, only 24 were successfully established. I don't know if the word only is the right word, but to us it was surprising. And um, they're breeding in Australia. They were breeding in 2014. That's why we went only to 2000, because we wanted to give them some time to establish and breed. And five of those were also established in Europe. So there's some common non-native species, like the common minor, for example. And the alien species, we once again looked at the exact same grid square size and the same methods. It ranged from 0 to 18 per grid square, with native richness ranging from 0 to 401. There are places in Australia with 400 species per 50 by 50 grid square. So you can understand how rich Australia is in native birds and why this picture is quite different of what a non-native bird faces when it arrives in a new area. It's quite a different story. This was just very recently, it's early on line now in diversity and distributions, published together with uh, Matt, who is a PhD student in my group from the US. Um, 15 birds were introduced to Tasmania, and 14 have established. That's very interesting, because that's quite a cold place. So possibly some of the European species and other species more successful. And then what we did, we took the introduction event data and we did something a bit different to what we had for Australia. We actually could, um, let's see if in the next, I think I, yeah. We could add Atlas data because Australia has this amazing project called Atlas of Living Australia. Any single record that could be verified from various sources like eBird and BirdLife and Atlases, etc. cetera, 
was collated by a big project funded by the Australian government. So there are about a million records, and we had overall 9,000 grid squares of Australia, including nearshore islands, but not the offshore ones. And we could complement the historical data we collected with the more recent and old as well information on where they are now. So we can actually take the introduction events and we can take the current locations and we can work on both. And I'll just go back because this was supposed to come after it. And we find that most introduction events were around urban centers. That's not very surprising in a place like Earth. Australian, Australian 90% of the population lives in urban centers. Almost everyone in Australia lives in a city. There were about 370 events around capital cities, which are the earliest cities in Australia. All of the species that we found that were established were introduced at least once near a city. So cities have a very important role here. And the largest number of introduced birds are in Eastern Australia, which was first settled, and in Tasmania, which was also settled quite early, as you know, they brought convicts to a different part of Australia. So this, these were the convict colonies. However, most places in Australia have no people, and they also have no alien species. And most places are quite dry. So if you look at the overall picture of Australia, there are not that many alien species everywhere. But in those areas of introduction, you see a very big variation in the current map of species richness. So we'll skip that. This is just a quick list for those of you that are birders or are interested in who are these species that we could actually validate. And there are also many failed ones, like surprisingly species like the chucker partridge was actually introduced but failed. Why? Maybe they shot them all in some places. They didn't introduce, but obviously there's more competition and more difficulty, big variation. You don't need to look at that in detail between the different Australian states in the number of species established and introduced. And we could actually map those patterns for the first time for Australia. And um, we could compare them to the patterns of Europe where we see that this island of the UK is a big hotspot, and we can compare Tasmania, which is also a bit more similar in climate to the UK, with um, Europe, with um, the U uh, UK and England, and we can look at those different patterns in space with the concentration of species around Melbourne and Sydney and some around Brisbane and those larger cities in Australia with you know, species expanding from those areas of first introduction. And then we could actually combine the environmental data and use that hierarchical partitioning. I'll skip that. Add a GLS, a general least square analysis, to add some spatial correlation structure and also look at directions of the relationships to test again these different hypotheses and these different factors and to look again at the factors explaining. Can you guess which factor will be the most important factor that we will discover we have found for Australia? So it was the native bird richness. In Australia, also when we removed the zeros, the areas with no introduced species, it's still the strongest explanatory variable. Most of the analysis were done removing those areas with non, no, native, no introduced species and also habitat diversity. This was important, but not very important and definitely not as important as Europe. So if you look at comparing those results in red for Europe and in blue for Australia, and in blue for Australia, you see that these variables, the more natural ones, climatic ones, are more important for Australia, while these variables, the more human-related ones, are obviously more important for Europe. And um, we could also look at more quantitative comparisons. For example, the native bird richness, how much of the variation is explained in Australia versus Europe, the habitat cover, and we could add those other more human-related variables and compare them and look at the different effects in their relationship. And that's all in the paper that's fortunately finally published. And um, we can compare Tasmania and the UK and look at those factors as well. So, you know, for when we compare Australia and Europe, they're quite different. And at the same time, early this year, there was a collaborative, quite a large collaborative project with um, Tim Blackburn and Ellie Dyer, uh, who did her PhD on the Gavia project, probably many of you heard about it, or some of you, which is the first global database of all introduced birds that she very 
worked very hard on during her PhD to create, and that was published in Plus Biology. I was also part of this project. And what we looked at is the patterns over time, globally, of the number of species, avian bird species introduced at the country level, not as detailed a resolution as we did for Europe. But if you know Tim Blackburn, you can trust that he will publish about 50 more papers about this in the very near future. And if you're interested, just read them. He's very, very quick and very good. And you can see the huge increase over time. And um, you can also see the global map of alien bird richness. So you're very welcome to go and read more about it. Um, and you can see Australia and New Zealand is a hot spot, the UK and parts of North America over the whole time frame. But if we look at it in split time frames, for example, if we split the period between 1500 and 1900, and we look at the locations of origin of the introduction versus the location of introduction, where we see them, we see that the origin was mainly from Europe. And during the colonialist period, they introduced them, especially the English, but also other countries, into Australia and New Zealand and India and Africa and America and various areas where they were actually colonizing. And if you compare that with more recent results from 1983 to 2000, you'll see a very different pattern. You'll see that most of the species, the origin of their introduction is from either India or Africa, like your um, parrots here in Sevilla, and they're very often introduced into Europe. So you can see very different patterns and their changes over time. And that's what a global analysis at the country scale, which will hopefully become more detailed over time, allows us to do. So a few thoughts and some ideas for future collaborations. So, you know, we always have an issue with survey effort because we're working like spies. You know, we're looking at historical data. We're trying to validate it. We weren't there 500 years ago. The Romans introduced species, pheasants, into Europe. We have them in our database. We know that some doves were introduced in mosques when the Muslims were in uh, Europe in the Mediterranean. So, but we don't have the exact details of all those. So there's always an issue with survey effort. Some places, like in Australia, where people live, they have more data. So we always try to control for it, but we try to control for it statistically. We don't really know what happened. So statistics can't solve all our problems. We, pretend that it solves it, but it's still an issue. We always will not know, have perfect information on historical um, data. And we also are seeing that the patterns of Australia and Europe are very different, which is something we are very interested in and we'd love to work more on other continents and look at. We see that there's a very strong pattern in both the global analysis and the European analysis, and not just for birds. There's a paper led by Peter Pijek and uh, 2010 in PNAS that shows the same thing for all groups. We all contributed our data, and we see that for many groups that human factors are very, very important in determining establishment and the, rich, the current is, um, richness, maybe also spread. That's an analysis to look at in more detail. The impacts, and that's really interesting, are unique. So, you know, Pepe and I had coffee today, and he told me about the huge impacts of parakeets here. We didn't find huge impacts of rose ring parakeets in Israel. So, each, and in Australia, they haven't even managed to establish. There's so many parrots there, so much competition. They, they, they're around, but they can't establish. So, each species has a very different impact in different places, and that's very interesting. We can't just generalize, you know, oh, this is a horrible species. Let's not let it in, or this is a wonderful species, let's let it in. We need to be very cautious on the first hand, but we need science. I don't need to persuade this audience about that, but we really need evidence-based information for management and also for not managing, because when we're not managing something, we're still managing it. If we do nothing about the rosary parakeets in Sevilla, we're managing them. We made a decision to allow them to grow to a very large population and to expand their range. So this was a decision we made, and we made a very important management decision. It's going to cost us a lot of money in 10 years. So it's always management decisions that the managers make. Um, it's led us to really interesting questions about Australian birds, because Australian birds are extremely aggressive. People in Australia are quite easygoing. They go to the beach, they go surfing. You know, in Christmas it's 40 degrees, and they're surfing and all that. But the birds there are extremely aggressive. And 
they've been isolated for quite a long time. And these are two very large group, honey eaters and parrots. And you know they attack people, there are signs everywhere. People put stuff on their helmets because they especially like attacking bikers. And everyone was attacked by a bird in Australia. And they attacked themselves and they attacked within species as well. So it's very interesting. There's some extremely aggressive species there. And we've just submitted a grant, a wood that hopefully will be funded to look at the aggressiveness of Australian birds. And I'd love to collaborate if people are interested to look at it more globally and compare them to other parts of the world because this opens many questions for future work and future collaborations. Now, I won't have time to talk about all this, right? Yeah. Uh, is, is the issue so, the yeah, great. And I want to leave time for some discussion. So I'll just very quickly browse through these. This is some work we did on Israel on cavity nesting birds. It's already been published. We compared species like the parakeet and other species that are native that breed in holes. We found some really interesting complex relationships between species like the mina, the parakeet that are invasive, the native house sparrow, tits, scops owl, and obviously the most important engineer of all the holes, which is the woodpecker, and another very aggressive introduced species, the Vrinus breasted mina. You don't want this species in Spain. And um, we also, I'll skip all this, but we also think that it's key to incorporate interactions between species into management actions. And this most recent paper, I think I have a slide of it, by Moti Charter, um, actually took little rings and put them on cavities, on holes, to make the holes smaller. So some species, native species, can go in, and some larger invasive species can't enter the holes. And we found that the smaller breeders, like the sparrows and the great tits, have a big advantage from that. So um, there's a lot more to explore. And I'll just show you some really nice pictures to end the talk. Um, we are starting to look at interactions. So. Um, we're starting to look at interactions. The pictures are more important than what I say. Between those different species, we have a few PhD students that have been working on this in the last three years. And it's fascinating. We put up nest boxes, and we watch the different interactions. There are also possums. That's a mammal in the boxes, and some other snakes and bees. And we put up nesting boxes. This is a sign we put up on campus at UQ in Brisbane. And we monitor them with this big stick we have a camera at the edge and we have a Bluetooth little screen that we can actually monitor them. And it's very cool and we look at those interactions with these extremely aggressive native species that attacks everything. So how do the alien species, you know, manage to establish? This is an alien species and this is Indian, this is an alien Indian minor, common minor, and this is a native species called minor. And they're very similar in the Australian accent, they say exactly the same word. Minor, minor. So it's like all the same, and, but they're very different uh, groups and species, and we're looking at those very complex interactions around natural cavities to try to quantify how the interactions affect the establishment and also the native species uh, over time, and looking at distribution mapping for various species and the interactions. So I went through this quite quickly. It's work in progress. We have a couple of PhD students working on this, Andrew and Francoise, who's from Spain, and hopefully they'll finish pretty soon and you know, advance their papers because everyone wants to finish their PhD papers, right? And publish them. So yes, they're at that phase where they're trying to finalize and submit. And hopefully in the next year or two, you'll see a lot of this coming out, but a lot of it is also work in progress, like our work on the interactions and aggression. So I want to thank you all again for your attention and um, also all the students and postdocs in my lab, our colleagues on the current project from Newcastle and Australia, and many, many research partners who've worked on a lot of this work in Europe, in Israel, in Australia mainly, but also globally, and the Australian Research Council that funds at least part of this work. So um, yes, come visit me. I'm in Israel until January, and then we go back to Australia where we're based. And if you want to do a postdoc and you have money, come visit us. <laughs> if you don't have money, we can try and find you some money together. But yes, come visit and thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>